Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to talk about why it is so hard to sell to quants on both the buy side and the sell side here. Um, I've been in this industry for, I don't know, 11 years now, maybe 12 -ish years, and I get a ton of people reaching out saying, Dimitri, I know you're running a team. Can you come look at our product? We want to pitch you this. And I turn down tons and tons and tons of products. Um, I'm actually doing some consulting and advisor services uh, as of recently uh, to kind of help some firms try to better position their products here. And I think this is where it's critical to be a quant influencer, which I don't think there's really that many of those out there. And I do cringe when I hear the word influencer, I know. Uh, but an influencer is different than marketing in the sense that they typically have some sort of expertise, at least is how I'm going to define it, some expertise in actually explaining why the product is good, why you should use it, or why it's complete trash. And so today we're going to dive into why it is so hard to actually sell products to quants. The first reason here is going to be they've already done this. They've been there. They've done that. So we're going to put experience as the first reason here. Um, I've been in many situations. Firms will come up and they will come up with a long, long laundry list of things they think are advantages, but they just don't know because the reality is most vendors have not been in the industry at all or they have not been in the industry long enough, or they have been in the not so technical side of the industry. And so they think they can create some simple solution that will solve everybody's problem, but they don't realize every big serious firm has already done this. So let me give you some of the common things I hear, you know, excuses, sales pitches with this. Um, one, whatever we have, our product is orthogonal. And what they mean by this is they're saying, all right, you have some sort of prediction, some sort of score. Um, and this comes in another flavor too. You know, this is unique alternative data. And what they're saying is that we have something that you don't have. We have some data, whether it's alternative data, unique data. Um, our product is orthogonal. It means that essentially everything you have is correlated in one direction. We are completely the opposite. We are orthogonal to that, meaning we have something new and cutting edge with this. These are typically, I'm going to tell you buzzwords. So I get these a ton. And these are going to be buzzwords here. But you see this a lot on the marketing press. The other piece that kind of plays into this as well, well with the experience piece is going to be metrics, benchmarks, and how you do this here. So I'm going to put performance. So to give you an example of this and a few different kind of perspectives on this, um, on the retail loan side, we use a metric called AUC, which is area under the curve. Uh, it explains how well a model splits out, for example, goods and bads. So loans are either good, they pay off, they're bad, they default, they didn't you know, make all their payments here. Um, and this comes with a lot of experience here. So I work in subprime auto. Uh, AUC traditionally is about 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. That is a good range. I know that's the range it's going to be in. Um, and again, this is going to be subprime. Now, when you get vendors with a lack of experience, they will come from the prime side of the market. Prime side of the market, almost everybody pays their loans. So AUCs can be anywhere from probably 80 to like 95-ish percent, even 100 percent. I've seen extremely imbalanced um, super, super prime models. Essentially, I can waltz out there and say, everybody's going to make a payment. I don't need a product and everyone will make the payment here. So modeling is not as critical on this point. Pricing these now is going to be a whole other issue. Um, so again, this is going to be like, if you had this for prime, this would probably be the wrong metric because you're going to be more concerned with accuracy and a pricing strategy and a bunch of other things. Now, when this comes down to it as well, when you look at performance, other things I'm going to be looking for is going to be um, rank ordering ability. So one thing I like to see is how the rank ordering of that model comes into play here. So now when I say this in a credit space, rank ordering is going to be, if you say, you know, like, let's just use FICO, for example. If you have a 700 FICO and somebody else comes in with a 710, that 710 on average better outperform a 700. So that is another characteristic and piece list. Depending where you are, so now we start getting into investment strategies here. Uh, investments are gonna start talking about like sharp ratios. Um, they're gonna say, well, sharp's not good enough. And then people are gonna deviate off of sharp and they're gonna have a bunch of other metrics they're going to look at. Um, again, it's a whole thing. But now you're starting to look at risk adjusted metrics. Depending on the space you are in, depending on your audience, you have to get this correct. If you come in saying this doesn't matter, you better have a lot of information on why it does or does not matter. Also, there are reasonable sharp ratios people expect you to be in. So if you get 
in this example, I'm talking about AUC. If you get too high or too low, um, now it's suspicious. Like something's not right with this product. And as an example, I had a vendor come in and they said, oh, we're at zero point, I don't know, like six, seven percent. AUC here for subprime. And in my eyes, that failed, right? It already failed. I knew you didn't didn't work for everything. And then of course, as soon as you start digging into the vendor, they go, oh, but we used our own personal data. So it'll be different than your data. So let's really get into this and let's, you guys, subprime is the rock bottom. We were working on deep, deep, deep subprime. Um, it didn't get much deeper than we were at. We were already in buy here, pay here land. Like I already knew where we were sitting with this. Um, it doesn't get worse than that. So again, AUC could have gotten better, but these sorts of met metrics are going to be critical here. Even with performance as well as benchmarking, right? If you're doing, I don't know, like a high risk, high leverage portfolio, and you're trying to compare that into like the S&P 500, um, and the risk is just vastly different, comparing returns, for example, as a benchmark is not a good kind of thing to be looking at. So again, experience is going to play a huge part into this. And I'm going to tell you the reason I see this so much is there's so many rookies, the tech industry, um, finance, business grads, business people as well coming in, trying to market to the quant space. And they go, oh, I have this great product. It's amazing. It's whatever, whatever. And we had a few small rinky dink companies that loved it. Um, for me, red flag, right? Huge red flag. Number two on here is going to be hand wavy sales. And what I mean by this is, you know, I know enough to know the product doesn't work. So I've been in many sales pitches where I've been in kind of a weird situation where I understand very, very well part of the product and it looks interesting and we're going through the discussions and they're hitting a lot of the, you know, this experience piece above that kind of sounds right. And then all of a sudden we get into a spot where I might not be an expert, but I know now all of a sudden it is very hand wavy. Um, to give an example on this, they will make statements like, you know, it's a one click solution. Um, or it will be like, oh, we have this amazing platform and it has too few features. And so I'll give you an example. This is working with a vendor that was trying to sell us a product and it was doing model implementation. So quant depth, which is actually a huge space for the vendors to be arguing and competing with right now. Um, and they came in and they're like, hey, it's amazing. It's great. Um, you do this, you click this, you click that, everything drops in. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. The modeling piece, the hardest part of this that you have like, why well, don't get it? It's one click. They go, yeah, yeah, it's one click. You go in, you drag your data in, you click these few buttons, right? Not one click, but it's a few clicks. And then it generates all these amazing models. And then you just pick the best model and you implement it and put it into practice. And I'm like, all right, well, I know, again, step one, my expertise knows the models that you generate are trash because I went through a lot of the metrics with them, went through the, the platform and everything. But step two was going to be the implementation process of this. Now, I worked in implementation long ago. It's been a long time. So technology's changed. Tools have changed. Processes have changed. I'm just in a different space now. And so I'm looking at this and I'm like, wait, 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 how do you get this into the production, you know, process here? And they're saying, oh, it goes through and we make an API. It's a secure API and it runs and everything. And I'm like, this doesn't, like, it sounds too easy. Like, how are you getting, you know, a model and like, can I import my own models? And they're like, yeah, yeah, you can import your models. So like, great, I'm going to import my models into this. And then it's just going to deploy them like it's just done and they say oh yeah yeah everything's handled it's just like that and I'm like like right it's it seems hand wavy something's not right here so what what do we do in the quant space uh, I pick up my phone or I hammer away on my keyboard here and I ring a buddy of mine and I go hey um I haven't done quant dev in a while this is the solution they're doing and he starts laughing he goes yeah yeah, yeah we know that guy uh and I'm like okay Tell me what's the issue with this. Because I feel like we need to do, for example, air handling. We need to go in. We need to check like latency. Like even though we're working on the sell side, so loans here, I care about latency. When we hit it and then all of a sudden I bring in someone else who has one of the software engineers and the head of software engineering is like, oh, it's killing us. I go, what do you mean it's killing us? They go, we tried that product out. Um, the latency is too slow. It's not working well. And so I'm like, all right, these are the things that the vendor's not telling me. They're not coming in and saying our product isn't, great, right? Our product is slow. Um, but it was the sales pitch. It's the hand wavy. It'll solve all of your problems. It's sweeping everything under the rug. And that really leads us to point number three. And point number three is going to be explainability. So I'll note on two here, quants hate being sold. I absolutely hate it. I would much rather order things online. I do my research. I look into things. I spend a ton of time researching products, tools, 
all kinds of things outside of the quant space, like buying a paint spraying gun to spray cars with and I'm painting cars in my garage. Going through this process, it's watching tons of videos and reviews and looking at products and types and you know how much air compressor you need and all these things. I don't like being sold. I don't want to go out there and be sold. I want to find an influencer, somebody who does this daily, weekly, monthly, that is going through this process that can really validate that here. Um, and so that's why the hand wavy sales approach never works. I don't want something slick and shiny. Um, it leads into number three, which is explainability here. So quants are really smart people, even when they don't know things, at least people that are really good in the quant space, um, they're going to want to have some sort of explainability of like how and why it works. And this is huge, especially on the investing side as well, because I see so many people say, I have this product, it's cutting edge, it's amazing. Dimitri, if I could just get a few investors, it would change the industry. And I have this performance and they show me these charts and it's like, great, you have some performance, you have some charts, what exactly are you doing? And they'll explain some brief things and I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Like that, that's not how the markets work. Uh, that's not how an arbitrage opportunity would actually play out in practice. Like, are you testing this on real money in real markets? Uh, you know, there's all these factors that play into this. Also on the sell side, so the loan side is the banking side when I work in this, I see this a lot too. I say, oh, can you explain to me, you know, how this product is going to solve these issues? And often I will make you score out what's called sample data. So I'll go out and say, hey, I need a retro, which is back scoring data we have. And I say, go score all this data with your magical model, your magical tool, or whatever you have. Send it over to me, send all this stuff back, and we'll do the analysis and review it and check it out. But again, I want to know how and why it's working. You can't just say, I have something novel and new. You have to prove theoretically that it actually works. Now, this is what I'm going to say is going to split the investing side in half because there is a large group of people that just don't care really explaining and understanding it. But I'd argue these are smaller, well -known, less well-known places that don't typically have a lot of investors. Because when you have a lot of investors involved, uh, the investors are going to want to know, like, what is the general strategy? How does it work? They have to sell that. So if they're buying your product and then they have to sell that uh, to the investors and more or less explaining these. So let's say they buy this amazing tool. They make a bunch of money for the year, right? We're all good. If you lose a bunch of money for the year, you have to explain now to the investors what happened. If you can't explain it, right, it's going to be a huge issue. Top leading quant firms that actually do risk management are going to dive in and want to know exactly how this works here. Now, even when you have vendor products, so I worked in what's called model validation, which is called model risk management at these big financial institutions. Often we'll purchase in vendor models and vendor tools and doing a validation on a vendor tool is an absolute nightmare because it is a black box. They do not want to tell you what is in the box, what's, you know, how it works, the pieces, the components. Um, so you have to go through this like awkward kind of dance of this rigmarole of going back and forth and trying to get like, they say, hey, can we have your marketing documentation? And so to work with big financial institutions, especially those that are regulated, you will be required to provide documentation. Uh, regulatory documentation that meets regulatory requirements. So you'll go through this process and you get all this information, you write it down and it's often very vague. And then you kind of go back and forth with the sales team and you get the technical staff on and you're trying to get comfort with this. Explainability and buy-in is critical here. If you can't get this on the quant space, you will not get investors, you will not get corporations, firms that are gonna be buying into that. So that is a key piece that to understand here in the quant space is explainability, which is why I have this YouTube channel a lot of times is to explain and go through products hand in hand um, because I want people to understand the ideas better. I don't want you to say, just trust me, this will just how it works in practice. And then to wrap this up here, there's two kind of interesting caveats with quant firms or funds or companies, whatever you want to call them here. And I'd like to hit on them. Um, one's going to be, they don't want you to know what they do and don't know. So this is kind of a hard point in the sales process. Funds don't want to seem incompetent or stupid. Um, so often they will either just turn you down or they will kind of ask you questions and then they'll ghost you. Um, this happens a lot of times because a fund might not know how to do something. So they don't have a great model. They don't have a process. They don't have something here. Um, but they don't want you to know that because they know that you're going to go and talk to other firms um, and they'll probably say that. Um, the other piece with this too, I'm going to say for recommendation and advice on companies selling things, do not name drop big names as clients as a sales pitch and a sales point. I have been on this with firms who have said, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Citibank are using this product, Dimitri. 
Um, you guys are a, you know, a fintech. You could easily use this product. We work with the biggest and the best and the brightest. And again, my phone comes out uh, or my LinkedIn comes out and I make a call and I say, guys, I worked at this firm. I've never seen this product. What the hell's going on? And somebody in that department says, hey, uh, yeah, no one's using it here at all. It's being used in the marketing department at the bank for like data analytics or whatever. And I'm just like, so then I go back to these companies and tell them, you're full of crap. No one's using this in the development department. And then tensions rise and people get upset. And I've gotten these pretty heated arguments with vendor calls because you're lying on your marketing. You're trying to say these other firms are already doing it. Don't worry about it. Trust us. Again, I don't want to be sold. Don't sell me on this. Be honest. Be a straight shooter at this. Um, but again, firms don't want you to know what they do or don't know. This is part of the game that you have to play as a vendor. So I will tell you, um, tread lightly, be honest, be transparent, especially like the explainability piece that will get you much further in this process, um, than actually trying to like, you know, game them and market them and kind of oversell them on that. The second part of this is going to be firms often want to see what the competitors are doing, which is why they will explore your product. And it's kind of twofold. One, if your product is really good and it works amazing and it's awesome, they will buy it up and they will use it because that's kind of a trial period. So a lot of firms like to do trial periods. It's something you can consider doing. The second piece of this is going to be they want to see what the competitors have available to them. So like you might say, let's say I'm doing a quant dev team and you bring in, you say, I'm going to, I'm being pitched the software to do all this stuff for me, um, but I want to hire and bring in my own team, right? I just want to do the process from the inside out. I have the expertise. You get more control and customization on this. I just want it in-house. I might look at these vendors just to see how they're doing things, what technologies they're using, ask the questions, get as much information as possible, and then I will go out and do it myself. So I know this sounds kind of negative or bad, but this is part of the discovery process of I need to really understand your product to figure out if it really add value. But also a lot of firms are going to do this kind of as a way to kind of gain insight into how to do the process. They don't already know how to do it or they might already know how to do it and do it great, but they're doing it to see what the competitors are using and kind of what is the the possibilities and kind of things are going to be facing with this. So in conclusion with this, really there's three main points of this you want to consider when you're selling to quant funds. And if you are a quant fund, things to kind of look at and to consider. One's going to be experience. Again, leveraging your internal expertise if you're the firm. If you're going to be a company selling that, get actual true experts have done this on massive, highly competitive companies. Do not hire people from rinky-dink, small business operations because I'm going to tell you, they have no idea what's going on. The more I'm in the industry, the more I realize the small firms, the small fintechs, the small banks, doesn't matter. Small investment shops rarely ever know what the hell's going on in the industry because they don't have the best talent. But lean on your experience and your expertise and your network to get that knowledge. Um, again, two is going to be watching out for hand wavy sales pitches again. Um, we hate being sold. I can't say that enough. Do not over promise things. Do not make things, you know, pie in the sky beautiful because you say it's going to solve all of my problems. I know it's not going to solve all of my problems because it's a vendor product. It's not going to be so easy to customize to my daily use. So don't use hand wavy sales tactics. And three, explainability is critical. Transparency, the more you can be transparent without selling your secret sauce of proprietary information, um, but being explainable, transparent, trying to really get on that level and help out um, that company when you're a vendor is critical. And when you're a company, right, if somebody's not transparent with you, I would not do the deal. It is a deal breaker. Um, often there's a lot of, again, hand wavy issues going on with number two, data model results have been faked, frauded, adjusted, trimmed, cleaned. Um, there are many ethical or not ethical ways, but not illegal ways to kind of fudge things. I would just stay away from things that are going to be, you know, kind of black box in general. So anyways, those are my tips and tricks on judging vendors, looking at the vendor process and how to kind of get through that from a company perspective and a vendor perspective. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And as always, until next time.